Throughout history, there have been people who have committed some of the most heinous crimes fathomable. For those crimes, they have been convicted and sentenced to death. Welcome to Death Row Executions, where we take a look into the lives of society's worst offenders. And now, your host, Air. Hello everyone, this is Air, and welcome to the 53rd episode of Death Row Executions. Today's story is on Daniel Lewis Lee, who was executed this year in 2020, and it was the first federal execution since the execution of Lewis Jones Jr. in 2003. For a little background information, the Supreme Court put a halt on executions at the state and federal level in 1972, but it was reinstated at the state level by the Supreme Court in 1976. It wasn't until 1988 that the government reinstated executions on the federal level, and although they have been slow, this year the Trump administration said that they were going to resume federal executions after a very long hiatus. This year there have been eight, starting in July of 2020, with Daniel Lewis Lee being the first federal death row inmate to go. Three counts of capital murder have been filed against Daniel Lee, alias Danny Lewis Graham, among other aliases. Graham's being held in Oklahoma, where he was arrested yesterday. He's fighting extradition to Arkansas. Authorities expect to have him extradited, though, within the next 30 to 60 days. Daniel Lewis Lee was born on January 31, 1973, in Yukon, Oklahoma. Growing up, he did not live in the best of environments and had no support at home. He was abused and eventually neglected, so he began to run the streets and hang around the wrong crowds. There is not much on his early life, but the first time he was sentenced for a crime was when he was 17 years old. One day, on July 24, 1990, Daniel went to a house party in Oklahoma City with his cousin John David. The two were drinking, and as time passed, Daniel ended up getting into an argument with another teenager by the name of Joseph because Joseph had peed on a recliner that another party attendee was sitting on. The argument escalated into a physical fight, and Daniel was able to overpower Joseph with punches to the face. Once Joseph fell to the floor, Daniel proceeded to kick him until he was unconscious. With the help of his cousin, Daniel was able to carry Joseph out of the party and transported his body to a sewage tunnel. Daniel then stole whatever Joseph had on him and then handed his cousin John a knife. After stripping Joseph naked and killing him with a knife, John and Daniel both left him for dead. The cousins were free until they were caught towards the end of November of 1990. Being that Daniel did not use the knife on Joseph, he was able to accept a plea deal to where the murder charge would be dismissed, and on December 2nd, 1990, he pled guilty to robbery and was sentenced to only five years in prison. His cousin John, on the other hand, was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. After being released from prison, Daniel still ventured on the wrong path and continued to drink and party. This time around, he began to hang around white supremacists and eventually became a part of the Inland Northwest White Supremacist Group. One day, while having drinks at a bar in Spokane, Washington, Daniel got into yet another bar fight, but unlike his fight before prison, he lost this fight and also lost his eye. Because of this, his fellow brothers nicknamed him Cyclops. Five years after his first sentence and fresh out of prison, Daniel was caught with a weapon on him, but instead of spending time in prison, he was sentenced to six months of probation on May 3rd, 1995. Around the same time, he met a fellow skinhead of the same age by the name of Chevy Kehoe. Chevy was a fellow white supremacist who grew up homeschooled in a household that preached anti-government and white supremacy. His father Kirby was a former Vietnam veteran who returned home and instilled hateful beliefs and values in his sons. As Chevy got older, he married two wives because he believed it would add to the population of the Aryan race. He also ended up forming a group called the Aryan People's Republic, which was a militia group designed to bring down the U.S. government. Chevy, along with his father, would rob homes on the hunt for firearms, and then they would go to gun show events in order to sell what they had stolen. Daniel, now a part of a new crew, became involved in Chevy's crime ring. It is believed that they took part in the bombing of the City Hall in Spokane, Washington, 
but were never charged for it. The following year, in 1996, Daniel, Chevy, and Chevy's brother Shane drove to Arkansas from Washington with the intentions of robbing a known gun dealer by the name of William Mueller. Chevy had convinced Daniel that it was a good hit because he and his father had already robbed him the year before. On January 13, 1996, the men put on FBI clothing and broke into William Mueller's home. No one was there, so Daniel and Chevy decided to wait. William finally arrived with his wife Nancy and their eight-year-old daughter Sarah and were immediately met by Daniel and Chevy who overpowered the married couple. William was unwilling to disclose where his valuables were, so Daniel and Chevy separated the family and demanded that Sarah let them know where all of her parents' money, guns, and ammunition were. Once she told them, all three of them were shot with a stun gun and plastic bags were put over their heads and sealed with duct tape. Daniel and Chevy were able to steal $50,000 in cash and the bodies were then put into Chevy's vehicle where they drove to a bayou in Illinois, taped rocks to their bodies, and then threw them into the bayou. After committing the murders, Daniel and Chevy went to different states and attended multiple gun shows in order to sell the stolen guns and ammo. Months had passed and it was now June of 1996 when the Mueller family was found in the water of Lake Darnell in Russellville, Arkansas. Daniel and others involved with the murder were not arrested until the following year in 1997 when police were able to trace some of the guns sold at the gun shows back to Chevy. Before the men were indicted on December 12, 1997, Daniel's partners in crime, Chevy and Shane, were stopped in Ohio for expired tags and this interaction transpired. It was just after 1.30 when the officer pulled over the blue Chevy Suburban with Washington state plates for a traffic violation. Neither man in the vehicle could produce ID, so the officer asked the driver to step out of the car. The man told the officer he borrowed the truck from a friend. He then refused to a pat-down search. Listen as the officer attempts to search the man for weapons. Like the guns, knives, clubs, hey, stuff like that on here, sir? Going, I don't want you going and searching through all my stuff. I'm not searching through your stuff, no, sir. I, I'm going to put you in my car. All right, you're fine, but I now, don't do you have any guns, stuff. knives, no, clubs, or stuff like that no. on you? Very good. No, listen, sir, I don't want no problems. I'm Wait. not going to give you any problems, sir. Apparently, he did want car. problems. A few more minutes went by. Then the man ran back to his car in an attempt to get away. The passenger then opened fire on the police. As the passenger ran into the woods, the driver sped away. Amazingly, no one was injured in this exchange. A few minutes later, the driver pulled into a parking lot, and when a Wilmington officer approached him, the gunfight continued. More than 30 rounds were fired here, one bullet striking a passerby in the shoulder. The nationwide search for the two men continued. Chevy was with his brother Shane, and they were able to escape custody. Shane was eventually caught first and worked with his mother Gloria to help catch Chevy. They eventually testified against Chevy and Daniel in court, with Shane admitting to them that they were in a white supremacist group that was anti-government and how they were involved in other major crimes. On January 5, 1998, the men were brought in front of a judge for their arraignment and the judge ruled that the men be locked up until their trial, which did not start until March of 1999. Daniel and Chevy had the same trial, but different penalty phases. The jury believed that Chevy was a partial victim and was manipulated by his parents and did not have the best upbringing. They felt his parents' views on life were abnormal, which made it hard for him, so they gave him three life sentences instead of the death penalty. Although Daniel's attorneys tried to argue that he had neurological issues, was a psychopath, and haunted from his abusive childhood, the jury did not buy it and sentenced him to death on May 14, 1999. The full charges were three capital murder charges, racketeering, and conspiracy to commit racketeering. The judge made it known that he believed the Aryan People's Republic group was created in order to start a revolution against America and build a new nation. In order to get to where they wanted to be, they killed, robbed, and sold stolen property. Daniel did try to appeal his case, with one point being that his Sixth Amendment rights were violated because testimonies from Gloria and Shane during trial were deemed acceptable when he felt everything was hearsay. 
He also tried to argue that it was not fair he and Chevy had the same trial and his wishes for a separate trial were not granted. He also did not think it was fair that his accomplice, who was the mastermind, got a lesser sentence. One of the last points Daniel tried to argue was that the government failed to prove that his Aryan group was involved in any conspiracy and failed to prove that he knew of a conspiracy and intentionally joined the group knowing he would then be a part of their conspiracies. The appeal court argued that they had sufficient evidence from the witnesses who testified, with one of them admitting that he was a member who helped recruit Daniel and explain their plans with him in detail. Start a violent that revolution. That they were attempting to form an Aryan People's Republic and in order to finance this revolution and establish this Aryan People's Republic, they were engaged in, in criminal activity. The criminal activity includes kidnapping, robbery, and murder. On July 8, 2004, the United States Court of Appeals denied Daniel's appeal for clemency. While on death row at Terre Haute in Indiana, Daniel maintained his innocence. When the Trump administration said that they would resume executions, Erlene Peterson, who was the mother and grandmother of two out of the three victims that were killed, filed a lawsuit or petition to halt the execution. She felt that going to prison during a pandemic would put her at risk, and she wanted the execution to be when the pandemic was over. Chief Judge Jane Magnus Stinson of the Southern District of Indiana came out with a statement after putting a hold on the original execution date. Miss Peterson is being forced to choose whether being present for the execution of a man responsible for the death of her daughter and granddaughter is worth defying her doctor's orders and risking her own life. Although Erlene wanted to be in attendance of the execution, she did make it known that she was a Trump supporter and had written him a letter asking to commute Daniel's sentence to life in prison without the possibility of parole, but that wish was not granted. I can't see how executing Daniel Lee will honor my daughter in any way. Because she wouldn't want it and I don't want it. That's not the way it should be. That's not the God I serve. The government ain't doing this for me, because I would say no. And I think President Trump is a God-fearing man. I voted for him and I'd vote for him again in 220 if he runs. If I could talk personally to President Trump, I feel he could feel my heart and know that I don't want this to happen. I believe that he should give Daniel Lee clemency for what he did. Just prison without any chance of parole. Up until Daniel's last days on earth, appeals were still being made to the Supreme Court. A little after 2 a.m. on July 14, 2020, the U.S. Supreme Court gave the go for the execution of Daniel to proceed. Daniel was brought to the execution room at around 4 a.m. and witnesses were still waiting in the witness room at 7.46 a.m. while Daniel was still alive and strapped in. The execution finally began and after receiving a shot of pentobarbital, he was pronounced dead at 8.07 a.m. His final words were, you're killing an innocent man. The Bureau of Prisons spokesperson refused to share with media what Daniel ate for his last meal, but it's been said that he requested three separate last meals. Thank you all for watching and now for discussion and question time. What do you think is the reason behind the Bureau of Prisons not communicating what his last meal was? Do you think they agreed to his three separate last meal request so they just decided not to share anything at all? What do you think of Erlene Peterson not wanting Daniel to be executed but still wanting to delay his execution in order to be present. If you are someone who does not agree with executions, would you still be able to watch the actual execution? Lastly, what do you guys think about Daniel getting a harsher sentence than the man who recruited him and came up with the plan to kill William? I think of my last story on Andrew Brannon who seemed to have flashbacks and clearly wasn't all the way there mentally versus Daniel's accomplice Chevy who actually planned things and went as far as getting fake police uniforms. I get that his upbringing was bad due to his father convincing him of his racist views and how a life of crime was okay in order to raise money for the cause of eventually having an all-white society, but do you think that should have been the reason to take away the death penalty? Don't you think they should have been given the same sentence, if anything? 
Before I go, I would like to give a shout out to Nichelle and Timothy. Thank you too for becoming patrons on my Patreon. I also want to give a big thank you to everyone who has subscribed on my channel. You guys are so supportive and these videos would not keep happening if it weren't for you guys. Um, maybe just like a month ago, it kind of had like a mini breakdown and you guys all made me smile and I'm super appreciative of all of you guys. So thank you so much and stay safe everyone.